He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Join us as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 493, verses 1 through 3. Name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearly beloved, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's confess. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all of your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the Kyrie.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We continue with the hymn of praise, hymn number 461. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the Spirit of truth whom you promised from the Father. For you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with our readings. Our first reading for the seventh Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 1. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about a hundred and twenty. And he said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us, and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, 
and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put, for, they put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. We continue with Psalm 68, verses 1 through 10. The epistle is from 1 Peter chapters 4 and 5. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, 
that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Alleluia verse of the day. Alleluia. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had spoken these world, words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you, since you have given him all authority over all the flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but... They are in the world, 
and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We invite the children to come up. Hey, guys. So, what do you see different today? Ah, I'm wearing a uniform. It's a different uniform. I usually wear, you know, the white robe with all the vestments and stuff because that's my uniform for what I do here for the church. But I had another uniform, and that was in the military, in the Army. And what is this weekend? It's Memorial Day weekend. And why do we have Memorial Day weekend? We have it to remember and honor those who have died in war for our country. And so, you know, one of the things that these guys would go to war in, years ago when they had the cavalry, and I used to ride in these big old horses, They'd have a saber like this, and they would go to war, and this is their offensive weapon, would be a sword. Now we don't have swords, but we have, some of you know, we have nuclear subs, we have nuclear aircraft carriers, we have big, fast F-18s and the F-35s and, and all the other kinds of really cool gadgetry. But, you know, when, when it used to be hand-to-hand -hand combat, this is what they used. And so it wasn't like you push a button and something goes off and, you know, an explosion happens miles away. It was face to face. And these men and women would sacrifice themselves for a cause, for a country. And, you know, God set it up. He set it up that every civil government should have a military to protect its population. That's called the left-hand kingdom. That's where we have the president and the governors, and their job is to protect the citizens of their state or of their nation. And God has ordained that those leaders have militaries to defend. Now, that's the left-hand kingdom. On the other kingdom, you have the church, the right-hand kingdom. And in that kingdom, that's where you and I are also. We are in this kingdom, and in this kingdom, we don't go to war physically. We go to war spiritually, and we have weapons too. But, you know, one of our biggest things that we have, we have a soldier who went to war on our behalf against an enemy that we could never defeat. We could never defeat the devil. We could never defeat sin. We could never do things the way God had set us up to do because our very nature was sinful. It was selfish. And so what did God do? He sent the best soldier ever. And who is that best soldier? Jesus. 
Jesus came down here in our form, in our likeness, and the weapons that he used, they weren't swords. It was the word of God. And he took on the devil, and he, he said, he allowed the devil to nail him to the cross. He allowed death to come and take him. And he allowed the enemy to go, ha, 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 I got you. But then what did he do on Easter morning? He didn't stay in the grave. He, he exploded from the grave. He destroyed our enemy. And then, if you were listening to our ascension service, 40 days after he exploded from the grave, this same Jesus went to heaven, and there was a war in heaven. And he drove Satan and a third of his of the angels out of heaven, kicked them out and said, no way are you going to be speaking ill against my people. And when he sat down at the right hand of the Father, it was done. Satan had no more authority. And so what's really cool, Satan came after us. But Jesus, he wasn't going to have any of it. He sent the Holy Spirit to be in us. He gave us the gift of faith. And that faith says, Jesus you're my soldier. You're my victorious one. You're the one for me. And Jesus gifts us his victory. And when did he do that? In our baptism. And in communion, we get strengthened every week. And this is what Jesus does. And so when we remember all the soldiers who have died for us as a nation, as the United States, we also remember the soldier who took out our most dangerous enemy, Satan. And Satan, with Satan comes death. And Jesus said, nah, Death, you're no, you're no big deal anymore because I've destroyed death. And I've given that life to my friends, my kids. And are you his kids? Yeah. How do you know? I am baptized. So then we can rejoice this Memorial Weekend over what Christ has done for us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending the soldier, the soldier who defeated sin, death, and the devil. We thank you, Lord, that you have gifted to us Jesus' victory. And help us, Lord, to love you more and serve others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you. Let's sing our sermon hymn.
He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, what a fantastic weekend to have these readings. You know, when we talk about Memorial Day weekend, you know, Memorial Day weekend is a secular celebration. It's a celebration of the men and women who have died to protect us as a nation. It's a, it's a time for us as survivors to say thank you so much for your sacrifice. You chose to go into harm's way. And it's a day to say thank you for choosing to lay down your life for your, your fellow countrymen and to sacrifice everything you have for those at home. And it's interesting because as we look at these readings, it's Jesus who's getting ready to go to the cross, ready to go into battle, the final battle, and what is he doing? He's praying. Well, and that sounds normal for us. You know, whenever our soldiers uh, over in, in, in Iraq or Afghanistan, anytime they went outside the wire, they would gather and they would pray. They would recite the Psalms. And they would ask for God's blessings before they went out into, into the danger zone. And so it was really kind of a cool thing to see all these rough, tough army guys getting together and saying, God, help us. And then say, load up, let's move out. Well, here's Jesus. He's going into the battle. He's not praying for himself. He's praying for us. You know, that's kind of a cool thing because here is Here's the soldier going into the battle, and he's not concerned about himself. You know, I would be concerned about myself because he knew what was coming. He knew the pain and the suffering and the shame and all the jeering and, you know, everything that was going to happen to him. Me, I would have been going, oh, God, oh, God, help me. Help me, help me. Jesus is out there. He's not saying that. He goes, no, I got this. I know. My father sent me here for this purpose. I've been training for this my whole life, and I'm ready. Now, is it painful? Yes. Is there any other way? I sure wish there was, but I know there's not. And so he's looking at his friends, his disciples. He's looking at us. And he's saying, I know it's going to be tough. You know, when I was in the world and they were with me, no one was going to touch him because I was the one who had all the power, all the authority, and there's nothing that any Roman could do to them or me outside of my father's will. So they were safe here. And I was there at creation. I was that word that went forth and things happened. That's who I am. I know who I am. And I also know who they are. And I know that I have to ascend into heaven. I know that I'm going to have to kick Satan out. And I know he's going to be kicked down to earth. And I know he's going after these my friends. And I will pray for them because they are by nature sinful and unclean. They are by nature selfish. And Satan's attack is to get people to be selfish, to not worry about the other person and to serve only themselves. I mean, think about it. Whenever there's an argument, are people arguing because they're serving the other person? Or are they arguing because you're not seeing things my way? It's selfish. You listen to the politics of today. Who's out there saying, hey, what's the best thing for people? What's the best thing for those who are suffering? 
And at the same time, what's the best for our nation? Those are tough decisions. And I don't want to be in their place. Because they have been called to that, not me. And so then we pray for our leaders. We pray that they are wise in their decisions and they balance health needs versus economy. Because if the economy falls, what do we have? Despair. So they, you know, this is all their job. And so the, the church, we pray for them. But you listen to the arguments that are going on. Is it self-centered? Or is it serving? Or selflessness? Is it trusting or controlling? And Satan is all about control. He's all about tempting to get you to fall. And if he can get you to fall, get your eyes off of Christ, he has won the victory. And so Jesus understands that whole scenario. He understands all that. And so what does he do? He prays. And look at our gospel. In our gospel, verse 8 or verse 9, he's praying to his father. And he says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given to me. Who's that? That's you. That's you, the church. For they, you, are yours, God. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, And I am coming to you, Holy Father. This is great. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. He's praying for the church to be unified. Because when the church is unified, what can happen? All sorts of great things can happen. Look at the congregation here. When this congregation, Peace Lutheran Church and School, came together and they realized, hey, we have a fantastic ministry here. Let's make this school work. And so what did they do? They bonded together and they pitched in and they made it work. And it is growing. And the ministry is going all over this area. And we have people who have graduated from this school, graduated from local high schools, and have gone around the world. And when you look, it's not just here. It's in the sanctuary here. People come into this sanctuary. And they're unified. There's a unity here. There's a familyness, a togetherness that says, hey, you are special. How do I know you are special? Because the Lord Christ called you in your baptism. That's what he did. And he did it for me, and he's doing it for you. And you think about it. Who here has something they're very embarrassed about in their own life? We all do, don't we? People have done really embarrassing things. And so what? In the church, the church does not judge the other person and say, what is your problem? The church says, yeah, you're in the same boat with us. Because you know what? My thing may not be yours, but I'm just as embarrassed. And and if you're embarrassed over that, guess what? We're together. We're in the same boat. That's why this is called a nave, a boat. And we're in it together. And so I'm not better than you, and you're not better than me. We're both the same in Christ Jesus. Because that warrior, Jesus Christ, came 
to me, came to you in your baptism. And he said, I know what's coming. I am the beginning and I'm the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And I know what's going to happen. And you know what? I still pick you. And if he did it for you, and he did it for that person over there, and he did it for the person over there, guess what? We're all the same in Christ. And that warrior, Jesus Christ, he won the victory for all of you. And he did it with joy because he saw what was on the other end and he was willing to do it. He was willing to die for us. And what's even more amazing is when he died for us, <laughs> we were enemies of his. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He chose us when we were flipping our nose off at him and saying, I don't want anything to do with you. And he says, oh no, you don't know what you want or don't want. But I'm going to die for you and I'm coming to you. And then you know what? That word's going to have its work in your life. And you know what that work is? That work is freedom. Freedom. Why do soldiers go to battle? So that we might have freedom. Freedom from other nations coming in here. But Christ came and he says, you know what? That's not even the issue. The freedom I give you is bigger than any other nation attacking. The freedom I give you is freedom in your own world. Freedom from sin, death, and the power of the devil. I give you freedom from guilt and shame. I give you freedom from those names, those labels that people have spoken over you. I mean, when you were a kid and you weren't the fastest, or you, you were a little bit heavy growing up, and they go, oh, you're a fatso. Or what are you doing playing sports? You're too slow. You're no good at this stuff. Or maybe you were a good athlete, but you were not good in spelling. And so whenever there was a class spelling bee, it was like, oh, great. Can I just go sit down? And it's really embarrassing because they give you a word like the, and you freeze up and you can't even spell the. You spell it T-H-U or T-H-A, the. What? No. And so it's so embarrassing. And so people go, what's your problem? You can't even spell. You're not good in math. What's your problem? And Jesus comes and he says, look, I'm taking all of that off of you. I'm removing the guilt. I'm removing the shame. And you know what? I'm putting it on my shoulders and I'll pay for it. That's what he did. That's what the, sh the, the sh soldier did when he went on that cross. He took all the shame, all the sin, and he took it, and he placed it on him, and he says, Father, here, nail me for their sin. And he did. And God the Father says, right on, son. The, the battle has been won in you. That's why Christ is seated at the highest place of all heaven. Because he took that. He voluntarily took it. He was the only one who could take it. And he took all of that on himself. Paid the ultimate price. And God said, because of that, bam, you get the highest place of all creation. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that one comes to you in your baptism. That one unites himself to you in your baptism. That one raises you in newness of life in your baptism. That one places you at the right hand of the Father 
in your baptism. That one now has the Father rejoicing over you with singing, with joy, saying, that's my son, that's my daughter. And one day you're going to see it with your own two eyes. One day you will stand in God's presence and you will look in pure love, the love of Christ. You will look into his eyes and you will see him face to face. And you will want to drop to your knees and sing his praises. You won't want to justify anything. You won't, I mean, it'll be so amazing. Reason can't even comprehend what that, what that will look like. But you will see the victorious soldier, Jesus the Christ, face to face. And you know, it's interesting when you look at our readings in 1 Peter, he says, beloved saints, brothers and sisters in Christ, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. You know, and that's the interesting thing. It's, it's coming. It's coming. There's going to be a fiery trial that it's coming to test you. Not to tempt you, but to test you, to make your faith stronger. Those things are coming. What do you think's going on now? Do you think this whole coronavirus thing is there just to tempt you to go another way? No. God sends these things to test us, to make us stronger, to say, you know what? I have to trust God without all these other helps. Oh, man. But guess what? You're doing it. You're trusting him for your very health, your very life. You're having to trust his word that he will protect, he will provide for you. And even when you foul up, you have to trust him that when he says, I forgive you, he means it. And he does, he does that in all these trials. And when you have people saying, close the churches, which is nonsense, absolute nonsense, because this is where the strength of society is built, is in the church, and they're trying to shut down the church. Well, guess what? The church says, go ahead, make my day. Because my Jesus' word is stronger today than it was yesterday for me. And your faith is getting stronger. And you know, one day these doors are going to be opened up again. And there's going to be such rejoicing as we gather together as the body of Christ. And we're going to not have any of the masks on. And we're going to belt out these hymns. Because of what God has done for us. So don't be surprised when these things happen. Don't be surprised if you get sick. Don't be surprised if you get old and one day you're going to die. Don't be surprised. It's coming. But has Jesus prayed for you? Yes. And when Jesus prays, does God the Father hear? Yes, and when God the Father hears, does he follow what Jesus asks for? Does he do what Jesus asks for? Duh, because he and the Father are one. Jesus asks the will of the Father. And what's the will of God? That people know Jesus and that they know and believe in God. That's the will of God the Father. So come those trials, come those tem or the, the persecutions, you make it. 
you survive because your hope isn't here. Your hope is in the soldier who has won the battle for your soul. So with that, friends, we can rejoice in what Christ has done. We can rejoice in a secular holiday as we remember the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen who have sacrificed themselves for you. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, dear saints, the peace that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts, your minds, in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks on this weekend where we as a nation Remember all those men and women who have died so that we might be free. But ultimately, Lord, it is the soldier who won the battle for our souls, Jesus Christ. And we give you thanks, O oh Lord, that he chose to go to battle so that we might be free. So as your people whom you have gathered from around the community and across the nation, we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, this, this day, this weekend, we pray for the families who have lost loved ones, who have sacrificed their lives for a nation, a great nation that you have brought and you have maintained that you guard and protect and that you provide for. We give you thanks for their sacrifice, O oh Lord, and we ask that you would bless the families with the encouragement that what they experienced is the same hurt that you experienced as you lost your son because of sin, because of battle. But you got your son back. And those in Christ, O oh Lord, will get their sons and daughters back come that day of Jesus Christ. So let that message, O oh Lord, of the victory that Jesus has won be proclaimed across this nation and around the world. And Lord, we pray that Peace Lutheran Church and School will be a part of that work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, we pray for our school and we pray for our students and their families that as we come to the close of a school year, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would continue to direct and bless our students, bless their families, bless our teachers and their families, bless our staff as they continue to move forward in the ministry that you have gifted to us. Bless the ministry here. And Lord, we give you thanks for the great work that is happening within this building, within our daycare center, as we prepare to do a better job of serving the people that you have gifted to us. So strengthen us, O oh Lord. Continue to supply all of our needs according to your riches and in glory in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. And Lord, we pray for your people who are suffering, who are feeling alone, who are feeling rejected. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would make yourself known to them even this day. 
and draw your healthy people to be your voice, your hands of ministry, your ear that listens for those who are alone so that your whole church might be encouraged and lifted up during these trials, during these tests of time, so that your whole church might sing your praises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, we pray for our leaders. Give them wisdom. Give them discernment. Let them see what's best for this nation. As people depend on their leadership to do the right thing. We ask, O oh Lord, that all selfish ambition would be laid aside and selflessness would be the, the name of the game even this day. Let our leaders, O oh Lord, do the right thing for our nation so that we as a people might prosper and do well and be united and be able to serve the rest of the world through the gifts you have gifted to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, we pray for our medical people. We pray for the researchers that you would direct their steps in a mighty way that they might find a cure for what's going on today. And then not just for a virus, but for all the other things that ail mankind, which ultimately is sin. So then let them bow their knee. Let them bow their work to the name of Jesus Christ, the one who did win the victory for all mankind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And on this Memorial Weekend, Lord, we remember our men and women who wear the uniform each and every day. Those men and women have a target on them. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy those on the front lines. Those who are willing to go to battle to protect what you have gifted to us. We pray, O oh Lord, for your strength, your boldness, your confidence as these men and women go forth and do what our nation has asked of them to do. Give them the courage to do what's right. Bless their families, O oh Lord, during times of deployment. Bring our men and women home safely and let there be rejoicing in what you have done for all of us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, we lift up all those that we name before you, asking for your grace and your mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. It is into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. As we trust again in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, dear saints, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance, his favor upon you and give you his peace. Amen. And dear saints, on this Memorial Weekend, we give you thanks and we give God praise for the freedom that he has gifted to you and me because of the lives of those men and women who have voluntarily 
given everything so that you might be or live in freedom. But again, who won the ultimate victory? Who destroyed death? Who destroyed the power of sin in this world? Who destroyed the power of the devil? The victor, the soldier, Jesus Christ. And he comes to you and he makes you one of his soldiers. And if you're in the Navy, you can be one of his sailors. And if you're in the Air Force, you can be an airman. But it's still his military that's going forth in this world, proclaiming the freedom that only comes in Christ Jesus. And because he has done that for you, you can go in peace and serve others. Thanks be to God. Let's sing our closing hymn, hymn number 493, stanzas 4 through 6, because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.